we thought we should have a first presentation here on topic, what is AI? Um, it's an abstract level and uh, um, um, let's say a bit of thought inspiring presentation I want to give you. And I want to start right away with a question, a little quiz, quiz question. Um, so what do you think, this is about maths now, what do you think um, about uh, capabilities of AI systems in the area of mathematical problem solving. Can today's AI system solve open mathematical problems? So hands up who thinks this is possible. Open An open theorem that no mathematician has proved yet, a conjecture that is still open. So hands up who thinks this is possible. Okay. So not too many, actually. Um, that isn't a surprise to me, uh, because there's also a question, a question about which AI systems we are talking about. In fact, you see here some headlines. The one is relatively new. CMU scientists solved 19-year-old geometry problem. There was a couple of years ago in Nature an article, 200 terabyte maths proof, a new contribution of a maths proof, an open source problem on Poolian uh, Pythagorean triples problem, uh, and that is the largest maths proof ever um, out there, 200 terabytes stored. And actually in 1976, there was already the four color theorem proved by um, AI systems. But these were systems not as the systems we are talking here about, these are SAT solving systems, but they belong originally to the field of AI, Unfortunately, there were winter times, summer times, I mentioned it again. So uh, this area was successful um, relatively early on already, despite the theoretical boundaries. We know about the problem of such solving problem. And it got then embraced by general computer science. So you don't see it too much represented anymore today in the area of AI, but it's an, an original um, um, AI problem. And um, There we are back again, uh, now with screen sharing also online. So we talked about SAT solving. That was an original subfield of AI. It still is. And uh, it got then embraced by general computer science. Um, in particular, in winter times, that makes sense because you want to attract money. And if there's winter time in general on AI and you have a successful technology, it eventually makes sense to not get the stamp of I'm an AI system. So take away here, there has been and there is success beyond machine learning applications of artificial intelligence. They are just not in the in the headlines of the um, um, media reports right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so usually I start such talks a, a bit slightly different and it's with these words, love, passion, emotion. Actually why I'm doing that is um, quite interesting story because 30 years back when I was a uh, young student at uh, the University of Saarbrücken, I got in contact with my later supervisor of PhD um, thesis, Jörg Siegmann, a pioneer in AI at the time. And in his AI lecture I said, we had a wonderful time right now because we are experiencing experiencing something very special, namely the rise of a new species in a way. Uh, computers will not only be get more intelligent in many, many different domains, but they will be able to reproduce and so on. So long before the talk about super intelligence, we were confronted with these hypotheses in the lecture courses. Of course, he wanted to get our attention by saying that. And he got my attention because I said, no way, that's not going to happen. Um, and I want to disprove that. And uh, I thought at the time, mathematics is the area that's really difficult. And there I would find a disproof of that. So that is why I entered AI from the perspective of how far can I go with automation of mathematical problem solving, for instance. But these points here, and yeah, or to say it in other words, meanwhile, I think mathematical problem solving is much easier than many of the other challenges out there. And that has a lot to do with exactly these topics here as well, law of emotion, passions. And that will also be relevant when we talk about uh, this week a lot about the connection between AI and ethics. And if we think about autonomous systems agency in general. Um, AI and love is also a good uh, point to start here because there are wonderful topics, out, uh, wonderful stories out there. I mean, until recently, falling in love with a person was um, destiny. Now, you know probably about that funny story here that was in the media, right? That little swan who what, wanted to date that pedal boat <laughs> um, in 2006. Yeah, and today, you know, 
relationships are uh, more and more determined actually by AI algorithms. And well, it's wonderful. I mean, think about it, how difficult it is for such a little swan to find the right dating partner. And it's quite, quite difficult to get out there and find an, a pedal boat. Um, right, and, and you see, we are all in love with AI technology already. Here we have uh, Peter and Katharina and their Saudi, and uh, there we have Pete and Katie with Dolly. And you see how, you know, that, that uh, enters all different parts of life, actually, artificial intelligence. And in fact, we see it as a steam engine of the 21st century. Here you see, uh, for instance, um, patent applications, um, AI-related patent applications versus uh, general patent applications, how that's um, currently behaving in terms of a dynamics. Um, well, we also know that exactly these kind of developments then might be problematic for uh, society. So this is a um, source, a potential source of social tensions and um, problems ahead we have to cope with. AI is clearly a controversial um, technology because on the one hand, we are debating about things like how can it help us to solve uh, global environmental problems, for example, but at the same time, training AI systems is a very expensive endeavor. So how much can we afford to train models over and over on all our gadgets and so on? Is that really the right way to go? Um, and of course, we should at an event like this not forget, forget about these things. So uh, right now, there are already systems with a high degree of autonomy being deployed, integrating AI technology. And that might be clearly a danger regarding military tension and escalation. AI is a dual use technology and we have to be aware of that. AI is an area with many subfields. We have knowledge representation and logical reasoning, which I mentioned in the very beginning on the side of symbolic AI techniques and on the side of uh, more sub-symbolic AI techniques, we have things like neural networks, combined with machine learning techniques, but you have machine learning techniques also on the side of uh, symbolic AI systems. For those of you who are not aware of that, pattern recognition, robotics, multi-agent systems, all these are subtopics of artificial intelligence. We have to be aware that there have been AI winters and summers. Currently, we are clearly still in a summer period, but also the dynamics on the now, especially also with the war, might change the situation again. So there could also be a winter time ahead, or at least a cool down period. I mean, the current hype um, is stronger than what we have seen before. For good reasons, machine learning has really made extreme um, progress, and we have wonderful success stories in that area. But Again, there might be winters ahead and we should be aware of that. I mentioned that uh, a lot of the recent success of artificial intelligence is connected with machine learning and uh, neural networks. And we will hear a lot of that uh, during this week, I guess. But you should be aware that we're here talking and that's part of the problem um, about systems uh, composed large networks composed of nodes that do not carry any semantic meaning their self. Um, nevertheless, it has been a very robust and strong technology in particular in very specific domains, not in all domains yet. And I mentioned some of the others at the beginning. There are cons, uh, I mentioned it also already, data intensive training is required, substantial human expertise typically, uh, tons of persons who actually label data now with their human expertise. Um, we have the problem of um, intransparency, of potential biases, and we have even adversarial attacks. So the idea to, um, by uh, clever means, to try to attack and train neural networks. <clears throat> On the side of symbolic AI, um, to just give a bit more technical substance here, uh, we are typically building arguments or proof arguments if you're, for instance, in maths. Um, so you start with some assumption, here's some definitions, let's say, in about sets, and then you use the rules of knowledge, uh, of logic, or in other areas, um, uh, handcrafted expert rules, for example, to build up a proof argument or a general argument if you're in other, other contexts. Uh, and that looks then somehow like this. So you, you conclude something, 
uh, from assumptions you postulate by the process of combining rules, and here it is the rules of logic. And that is at the same time a very good explanation of, for what you are doing. So there's no intransparency. They can even verify that later on with independent technology. This is the difference to uh, what we typically do when we train models in sub-symbolic AI. Um, so symbolic AI is the intelligence. Uh, here we have it manipulated as uh, um, on abstract level by composing meaningful representations in terms of logical rules or handcrafted uh, expert rules. So many currently believe, nevertheless, that the term AI should be kind of uh, reformulated in the direction that we are just talking about data and machine learning put on top of that. That is what currently happened in the last decade in particular. So this is the, the, the current perception of artificial intelligence value. I'm not so sure that that will be still be the case in 20 years to come. And I give you uh, a few arguments later on. The first one is related to my own definition of AI, uh, my working definition, which is kind of guiding my own research. So of course, you all know that we have to distinguish between weak AI on the one hand and strong AI questions on the, uh, on the other hand. And uh, you got my inspiration, my motivation at the very beginning. I'm in particular interested in the big questions here in, in direction of strong AI. And um, if you look at that, then um, for me, uh, strong AI at least requires uh, different levels of capabilities or different sorts of capabilities. The first one is simple problem solving, um, playing Go or classifying pictures and so on. And there we are dealing very well already with AI, with the data-driven machine learning technology. Um, there's also the exploring and the acting in the unknown territory. Think about the Mars rover and so on. And there we already need some planning ahead and might want to combine our techniques from different sorts of these AI subfields to get such a Mars rover running. Um, but then there comes what we humans actually are very good at is also this abstract and rational reasoning. Think about mathematicians or phys in, 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 in physics where you explore a new, a new theory right, by observing data. And then, then you have a new theory which generalizes over these things and you formulate it. You, we educate our students in classroom with these, these information then, the abstracted generalized theory. Right? Um, sorry, I'm jumping here in the wrong direction. Um, then think about self-reflection. We are well capable of detecting our own mistakes, right? Uh, these trained neural networks seem to be completely agnostic about the detection of an own mistake. So there's no pain to feel here uh, when you refute yourself or when you do something wrong. Um, and then think about the aspect of social interaction. So the adjustment of, for instance, personal goals that actually have an influence on all the other layers before, uh, eventually, uh, for an, an intelligent entity to the values of those of an entire community or society to achieve a greater good. And I think these are all kind of um, questions that you have to address when you look into strong AI and probably a few more that I haven't, haven't picked here. But this is my working definition of artificial intelligence. And that means I think that machine learning is addressing only it's, as we define it so far, AI and machine learning as we define it, uh, at the moment is addressing only mainly uh, problems at level one and two yet. And this is at part of the problem. There is no self-reflection, there's no self-awareness in these systems we are, we are building. And I think in the long run, therefore, uh, and at the moment that's already happening, we will be looking more and more again into questions of hybrid AI or neuro symbolic AI, so to combine it uh, with the other techniques that we have studied before. So that is what we need, a combination of techniques on the symbolic side and the sub-symbolic side in the long run. And I think, and I will have another presentation on that on uh, Thursday, I think that the combination in particular has also some potential to solve some of the um, governance um, challenges that we have by the combination so that we can, on a symbolic declarative side, eventually pose some constraints for systems uh, taken to be taken into account that are trained by sub-symbolic means. And this interaction, uh, I will motivate a little bit more than in the Thursday presentation. So that is, I think, what the next big thing will, will be um, and where we have to look into. Well, if you look in current uh, headlines in uh, presentations in newspapers and magazines, you see sometimes pictures like these here. So that, you know, people talk about an evolution of a news 
thesis, coming back to the initial questions I raised and the initial intrinsic motivation that, that uh, drive me into this field. Uh, I don't see it actually like this. Um, at the moment, with uh, the strong focus on just uh, training neural networks, I see it a little bit even like this. And I want to explain to you now why. Even, I mean, you might say provocatively, and I want to be a bit provocatively now, you might say we are at the moment training parrots uh, that are just repeating information we have already out there uh, and doing that in a very clever way. Think about this here. We, we learned counting probably, I don't know how many millions years ago or thousands of years ago, uh, we started to look into maths. But then certainly from counting, we discovered natural numbers and, uh, and eventually even and odd numbers and square numbers and prime numbers. We teach them today in school and so on. But we have an abstract theory. We have a clear definition what the prime number is. We, we understand it in relation to the other operations. So what we are doing nowadays is we are taking now this knowledge about prime numbers, such a prime number table, and we are feeding this information, this labeled data into an AI system. And then the AI system, of course, would train very well on, let's say, one billion of such uh, labeled numbers. And it would have actually be a very good prime number parrot, better than I. M under stress situation or under test situation if nobody gives me a calculator. So this prime number parrot would certainly outperform me and it would be certainly as a prime number parrot economically more interesting than me as a human in such a situation. So, but does it know anything about mathematics now? Has it any clue about what it's doing? Uh, is there any value, for instance, in now communicating what it does. What do we expect if you're now asking for transparency here? So what could the neural network eventually tell us? Because there is no relation when I do this sort of training to um, even and odd numbers, to multiplication, to addition, and so on. We just labeled the data, human knowledge, expertise coming from this you know, evolutionary step to a symbolically described theory. And now we are going back and take experts that label the data and then we train a model and then we expect something very interesting in the model. So by that example, which is of course a provocative example, um, you see where the problem eventually comes from and that questions about transparency and opacity might not solve all the problems because here it would not tell you anything about why it told you that this is a prime number or not. It can just tell you because somebody told me so, I got the label, that's all, right? Okay, um, that's the end. Here, so I think we have an evolution of understanding on humankind side, and we have now a simulation of understanding when it comes to training models. And this creates lots of the problems on ethics, uh, on AI and ethics. And think in the last, uh, the, the, the last slide before my key, uh, key points, uh, the takeaway points, think about thought experiments as a very extreme case. So humans, and we have mentioned thought experiments in the last talks already that, that that is something we are probably going to do here this week so will ai systems be able to do thought experiments ai systems that always need training data as input um, these thought experiments come out of the blue these philosophers uh, you know Anselm of canterbury who a thousand years ago were sitting there and then thinking uh, from the definition of what a godlike being for instance could be reasoning for or against its existence or so right so pure thought experiments played a fundamental role in many of our fields but today's ai systems seem to rely always on labeled data and training training input so that is a challenge i think we have to be aware of. Takeaway points. AI has many subfields. It's not limited uh, exclusively, uh, exclusively to neural networks and machine learning. There have been successes in symbolic and sub-symbolic AI. Typically, you don't hear at the moment so much about successes in symbolic AI in the media as you do on the other side. There have been AI summers and winters. And in the current climate, we actually don't know what the next 10 years will bring. Um, AI is clearly a dual use technology. We have to be always aware about that. Um, data driven AI is extremely economically relevant and interesting, wonderful success. But I think conceptually with the slide as explained, it might even be a step backwards from the big picture of developing strong AI systems at least. It's not the full story we can be 
expecting here. And the next big thing, therefore, I think, is in the direction of hybrid AI or neurosymbolic AI, where you eventually get feedback loops between these two layers. That's it, what I want to say. Thank you. As Professor Christoph already mentioned, AI is already beyond the hype. Actually, we are now in an AI summer, and that's, of course, pretty positive for the economy. Basically, AI projects are currently bringing a lot of value in different domains, like, for example, chatbots, continuous forecasting, predictive maintenance, etc. cetera. Um, however, there is still a pretty big problem for the industries, and it is that about 80% of AI projects are failing to move from POC, or proof of concept, to production. And of course, that's very painful. There are many reasons for that. And today, the focus of the talk is to talk about these problems. So of course, I know that in this audience, you are basically coming from different backgrounds. So some of you are coming from um, psychology, ethics, and some of you also from engineering. Because of that, I'll do my best to use as least technical language as possible. And I want to introduce the machine learning life cycle with as simple as possible uh, vocabulary. So for that, I'm going to use an example that I think it should be easy for everyone to understand so in this case, the example is about um, basically a system that detects um, skin cancer. If you have a carcinome, a melanoma, et cetera. So basically in 2017, um, Stanford research team achieved a performance that was way better, or a little bit better than the dermatologists at a time. And of course, this publication took our attention uh, basically everywhere. And we were wondering, is it actually true that even some uh, team of engineers, data scientists can actually be better than the dermatologists at this particular problem. And of course, when you have a deeper dive into this, you realize that that was true when they focus on that subset of data. That means these patients, that location, and um, basically that type, time of the year. However, of course, different companies have been trying to create a startup out of this, basically bringing this uh, project into production. And of course, the number of challenges that appear are basically very, very large. So in this case, I'm going to start talking about the workflow of a researcher. How can a team of researchers develop such an algorithm? So basically, when they are in the laboratory, they have three main tasks. Number one, they focus on veterinary engineering. That means they collect a very stable static data set that they use later to train uh, their models and basically try different architectures, optimize it. And then when they have a good performance, they basically create a publication or very strong statements that now we're better than dermatologists. Then, of course, they go to the third step in the workflow. They go to deployment. In this case, in research, actually, they are not deploying models at all because what you do is you save them locally to basically uh, create these experiments. Of course, when you not, don't work in research, because research basically is the first step in basically we do at Apply AI as consultants. But when you want to move to production, and production means trying to put this system or this model, sorry, inside a system, for example, as a handy, as a computer, as a, for example, a car, and make it work with a human, that's exactly where the problems start to happen. So for example, here we can have a three set of problems when we move to production. So in the first case, when you look, you look at the data aspect, data engineering, what you can see is that the data is not any more static, but actually in real life situations, the data is actually uh, very dynamic and is changing all the time. On the second hand, when you're trying to develop a model, you don't have one researcher or two doing this, but you have a team and maybe the team is inside a department that belongs to a corporation. So you have a lot of stakeholders that want to work together with you in the same project. And it's basically very challenging to collaborate. Of course, then when you go to the deployment um, stage, basically what's happening is you deploy your model and basically, finally, some users that have no idea about AI, they start to use your model, get predictions, and basically see if they get value or not. Of course, if we want to go a little bit deeper, we want to have some examples. What happens if this app, we want to change it? At the beginning, let's say we train it with a static data set in Germany, but now we want to move to Africa. So in this case, there are a lot of questions that I will ask right away. So basically, the first one. Does my model work on different skin color, taking actually from different smartphones with different angles, different light conditions? 
is it going to work for all of them? That's the main question. Second, what models is the next team? Could be in the USA or in the next department. What model are they using? Is it the latest model that we develop in our company? Are they up to date with the state of the art? Third, what happens with the new architecture um, that we are trying in the next iteration is worse than the previous one. Basically, can you roll back to the best version that you had before? Is it smooth to do this aspect? Yes or no? And also, is my model risk team to some implicit bias? In this case, quite relevant for you in the case of ethical. So of course, when we do um, develop uh, basically AI in production, there are different constantly changes of data and model. As I mentioned, they are not static, they are dynamic, and they are moving. So for example, let's focus on a business um, use case where you have a data set in 2019, last quarter. Of course, if we ask our data scientists to train a model, basically they do, they do train test split, they train the model, you have the first version, um, everything is good. However, as you know, times goes by, you will get more data. And now you are in 2020, quarter one. Of course, if you repeat this process, you will actually train a different model that needs to be named with a different version. In this case, it's version 1.1. Also, if you repeat the process in, two, in, in 2020, quarter two and quarter three, basically you will get different versions. And also if you want to make an experimental data set, basically you have this. But the, the problem is, can you answer these questions? Do you know which model was trained on the 2020 quarter one data set? If somebody from the regulation comes to you, hey guys, somebody died because this model made a bad prediction. What raw data was used? Who trained it? Who did the train test split? If you cannot answer these questions, you cannot comply to a regulation, and basically you will be fined. And of course, more than fine, it's they have a lot of bigger implications, of course. And that's why this amount of new challenges that are coming basically in AI um, needs to be paid special attention. Also, sorry, um, what data set was used to produce the experimental one model? For example, in this case, you can see if you keep a proper management system between data models and deployment, you can see the lineage between all your assets and you can answer any question for any entity that comes to you. The third question would be, what was the accuracy of the model on 2019 quarter four? Can you track it? Also, which models were deployed back in the last three months? Do you have a proper model registry? Do you have a feature store? Can you answer this question? Not only that, but also in the last few years with our partners, we have discovered new fundamental challenges. So we had a working group with about 12 of the largest German uh, companies in AI, including uh, Siemens, uh, Roland Spart, et cetera. And basically we tried to come up with what are the typical challenges of bringing AI from POC to production. Here we're just naming three activities, but there are a large amount of activities in the life cycle, as I will explain later. But basically, about data versioning, the question was, can we reproduce our trainings with a specific model? Um, which data set was basically used to train this model? About scalability, can we increase the amount of data steadily? How can I organize this huge amount of data in a way that it can scale, it can serve a, lot of, on a large number of users? Accessibility. How can I avoid data silos? So for example, it happens in some big companies, car companies, for example, where you have different departments and it happens to many colleagues, they had to get data that basically other departments already had. And not only with data, they have to train models that other departments, but they didn't know about it, already did. So basically they have to create the wheel once and again and again. And that's good, it's a big pain. About experiment tracking, it's about transparency. Can we see my past experiments? Or can I see what my colleague is also training right now? Because maybe what he's doing now, then I should not do myself, it's already done. Traceability, already mentioned, how can we keep track of the model data that was used, IP parameters, infrastructure, libraries, etc. Can we keep track of all of this? Comparability, can I compare my experiments with all my colleagues to basically find the best setting? And also when we come to deployment, it's actually pretty challenging to know which model version has been deployed to the correct endpoint. And also, as I mentioned already, sometimes you have a model that's performing good and is generating some revenue, but then you get more data, you train a new model and you replace it. 
is that okay? Could it be that the new model is actually worse than the previous? Should we not we have some strategy to replace the models? And basically that's a field that's named deployment management. And many companies, unfortunately, are not considering it at the moment. Accessibility, what colleagues and business stakeholders can actually access and see what. We know we have a lot of people in our companies that are not technical, basically business stakeholders, regulation stakeholders, and they don't know how to code. We cannot tell them, yeah, you can access it in the database or in the data lakehouse. You have to basically create an interface for them, an UI where they can click, drag and drop, so they can actually see all these insights. Of course, um, when we collected all these challenges, basically this is mapped to a new discipline that's named um, MLOps. That basically, it's I heard you. I guess you have heard uh, about this term. It's a very very new discipline inside the field of AI. That basically is taking care of designing principles and tools that support progress through the life cycle by using um, basically the best practices. And of course, it's exactly what I mentioned. In MLOps, we want all our experiments on projects to be reproducible, you already, you already explained it, accountable. We want to know why this person was filtered out with this genre or this age, why these decisions were made. We should be able to track that always, all the time. I know why this happened. Collaborative also should be able to explore the work of others and they also should be able to see what I'm doing. So basically we have more transparency and we can collaborate together. Also continuous, we can actually, we should be able to deploy new models in a way that the traffic is not interrupted. Scalable, of course, we need to be able to scale on data, but also on model and also on deployment and not all together like a monolith. Because in some use cases, you need a lot of data, no about a very small model, for example. But in other use cases, it's exactly the other way around. So basically all these components should be able to scale um, independently. And last but not least, trustworthiness. That's exactly the topic of today. Can we trust actually the model that I'm using? Am I sure that I won't be discriminated in this interview, automatic interview process? Of course, once we know these principles of uh, MLOps, we come up with the concept of the ML life cycle. That is nothing else but a cyclical process to basically develop, uh, train, and deploy AI model using all this huge amount of data that we have in our company. Of course, the main slogan of ML life cycle that we think is standardizing the ML development and deployment can help to tackle all these challenges and the MLOps principles. If you don't have a systematic approach, then basically every use case, you will have different pain points and you will have different problems. In this case, in the ML life cycle, I'm showing here the very first layer. So basically it's a hierarchical model where we have in the level one, the stages of the life cycle. So in the first place, we have the scoping stage, data engineering, modeling and deployment. Of course, um, something that's very important is to highlight all these circles that you see here, because that means that when something wrong or a challenge appear in any of the stages, you might need to come back to the previous one to fix it and then move forward. For example, if you deploy a model and it turns out that the distribution of your data change because of Corona or any other situation, you might basically need to come back and basically either retrain your model or come back and collect new, new data, create new features to actually improve it. And this is actually what we want to tell with this focus. When we go to the second layer, so we name it phases, you can see that the data engineering stage is formed by three phases. Basically we have data ingestion. So in every project of AI, you have to ingest data. There is no possibility to do it without it. You have to prepare it. Sometimes you can spend up to 60, 70% of your time here. You have to manage it. And this is the most important part that most of the life cycles on the industry are not including. Third one, you have to, uh, four, sorry, you have to model and you have to train your model. And super important, model management is the fact that you can link your models, artifacts with your data artifacts. And you can actually have a layer of management across all of them. And of course, what I mentioned already before, we have in the next phase, deployment management how we can deploy a model in an automated way that doesn't interrupt the traffic of the user and also allow us to select the best model. And last but not least, we have the monitoring and maintenance phase where basically is after you deploy your model, for example, in your car and it's working, we have to keep track and make sure that the performance and accuracy is high enough over the time. And even though you have data chips, you want to make sure that still your performance is good 
And if it's not, you should be able to automate the process of fixing this. Then we have two more phases that are super important for us. That's basically DevOps, the one that you see here in gray. This one actually is starting from the beginning, data engineering till the end, because in order to do data engineering properly, you need to have, of course, a data warehouse or a data lake or a data lake house, et cetera. So you have to take it into account from the beginning. And also adapting and basically following the best practices for software design and development, it's also mandatory. And we wanted to include it in the life cycle as one of the main phases as well. Now, when you go to the next um, level of the life cycle, you have activity. And here, what we can see, of course, there are too many. Now we have a very short talk, that's not too long. I will just mention a couple of them per, per phase so we cannot make it too long. But for example, when you are in the scoping phase, of course, uh, at the beginning, you don't know what use case to select. And for that, you have to basically have an ideation phase with your customers, in this case of Apply AI, where we come up with a lot of use cases and basically we prioritize them based on complexity and business value. Also for each of them, we define our metrics and goals in advance, and we decide what data is available, what team is required, and what infrastructure is required. When we, we move to data ingestion, we make sure that the data that's available, it's compliant. In some cases has happened that we started a contract and then the customer realized the data actually, nobody can use it because it's not compliant and they cannot actually use it. So that was a waste of time. So it's super important to make a data compliance check from the very beginning. Also, as you know, you ingest different sources and for that you have to basically take into account different formats, also heterogeneous sources. In every company they have basically databases in different teams, even a CSV file hanging in your computer. All of those sources you have to basically bring locally on the U control so you can actually version all your pipelines. If it's not on the U control, when somebody else change it, you have no way to reproduce and comply to anything. In this case, the regulation. When we go to data preparation, of course, it's important to understand your data, explore it, have some validation checks to make sure, for example, if it's a value that needs to be positive, then you make a check that this value always is larger than zero. Otherwise, you raise a warning on an error. Of course, processing and labeling, it's most important, but they are self-explanatory. When you come with data management, data versioning is basically, in my opinion, the most important aspect. Many companies underestimate it. I think that's still a problem nowadays. Um, basically, if you have data versioning in place, if you know that this data or table, for example, produce that table and that table, and you can see the lineage, basically, you will be able to reproduce your data pipeline in any time. And that's why it's very important to keep track of that. Um, sometimes, basically in Apply AI, what we do is a data dependency graph, which allow us to have a clear visualization of this structure of the data dependencies. Of course, in model training, you have train test validation speed, super important, log the decisions, why? Why you filter what? What is set up, what is split? Also in your model evaluation, make sure that the model that you are evaluating basically has the right metric that was defined in advance. So for example, you can use precision recall, F1 score, et cetera, depending on your use case. And when we go to deployment management, of course we want to deploy the model. Um, in this case, sometimes you don't deploy only the model, but also the pipeline that you use to create the feature. Because in that way, when you have a new data point, you can basically reproduce uh, the whole uh, pipeline. Um, last but not least, at the end you have uh, monitoring and maintenance. It's super important to keep track of any data drift or model monitoring, and also interpretate your results with interpretability. And in case that you have any shift, of course, it's always useful to have an alert or a report so you can actually react on time. Um, I don't know how, how long I have, um, because the time was shifted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, this is the last slide, actually. Perfect. So basically, this is what I was mentioning. In this case, you can see the phases of the life cycle. And let's say we deploy a model, and basically, it's being monitored and maintained. When we have too much traffic, basically, it's a good practice to automatically scale up the deployment so you can serve this huge amount of users that want to use your model. What else can go wrong? For example, it could be that the latest model that you deploy is worse than the previous one. Because of that, you have to automate rolling back to the best version always automated. What else can go wrong? For example, here, uh, when your model is biased against certain minority, 
this is huge aspect, very complicated, super hard to basically fix it. You should actually try to go back to your training and see what went wrong. And if there is any way you can actually fix this bias in a way to make it less biased, of course. Um, of course, a slow inference time is also important. Um, maybe if your model is too big, you can just reduce the number of layers or neurons or the architecture so you can make it faster. Of course, it depends a lot to the use case. Also, in case you get some interpretability and the results are not aligned with what you expect, maybe something also went wrong, then you have to go back to data preparation and try to understand what went wrong and create more useful tissues. And also, it could be that there is a bad model performance for a specific prediction class. Um, for example, you have an imbalanced learning problem when you have two classes and one of them, you have a lot of data points, but the second one, you have not too many. So basically you can go back to your congestion and try to get more samples of this minority class. Of course, also you can correct for data drift by only taking into account more, more recent data points. That's also one typical approach. Um, you can do a model bias against certain minorities, so you can revise the data collection strategy in this case. Um, I think the last point is going to be the data shows consistently different input scheme. So for example, if you have a table with five columns, and then when you get the data, the next iteration, now I have six columns or one column was modified. In that case, it's a really real mess. So you have to basically have some scheme evolution in place to handle this. And this is actually one of the main problems our partners are also experiencing. Um, I think this is the last one, of course, when you have a deployment bias, um, basically it happens when the model is used differently from what it was intended for. For example, if I wanted to use the model to brake uh, a car automatically, but at the end it's used for any other application inside the vehicle, then basically you have to go back to the scoping phase and basically revise your strategy. Okay, so I think the summary we can do it later. I think that's, that's all.